This is Patrick Henningsen. I'm your host here at the Sunday Wire, and we are turning over uh, a new year. Uh, we're looking back at 2017. This has been a phenomenal year on so many levels, uh, and we're looking forward uh, to 2018. And uh, to help us along this journey, and this is quite a, uh, a big task this year, especially um, 2017, one of the most anticipated years uh, since the turn of the millennium uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, but to help us with this, our guest uh, today is Dr. Tim Anderson. Uh, and he is a professor uh, in the Department of Political Economy at the University of Sydney in Australia. And uh, Tim is joining us on the live link from Down Under. Hello, Tim. Hi, Patrick. Great to have you with us. Uh, and Thanks very much. Really appreciate the time. We're on two different opposite sides of the planet. Uh, so hopefully this uh, connection holds up. But um, thank you so much for joining us. Tim, you've had a, a quite an extraordinary year yourself. Uh, and I think you've clocked in quite a lot of air miles. As you should get a free ticket after this year <laughs> somewhere. Yes, I want to visit a few countries that I hadn't been to before, as well as the ones that I had. In particular, I made a bit of a specialty of going to countries that are under threat from my own country and from a number of the Western countries. Um, so that's why I went to North Korea and Iran uh, and Iraq for the first time this year, as well as some other countries that I've spent a lot of time in in the past, um, Cuba and Syria, for example. Yeah, and just uh, t tell us, I know you, you have spent quite a bit of time in Syria. We'll, we'll talk about Syria in a minute. Um, just give us your, also your, your impressions of those countries that were your first, uh, first visits to. Um, how did it square up with your, sometimes you have anticipations of what things will be like before you go to a place. It's kind of in your imagination and based on things that you've read or seen on television, and, and then you, the reality comes. Wh which of those journeys w was was kind of a shock or was a real jolt in terms of completely different than what you had anticipated? Yes, well, um, that's right. I mean, uh, North Korea, I suppose, was the most dramatic experience for me because although I'd been generally aware of the history and had some sympathy with that country being under attack, I really had no idea, um, you know, of what I was going to see. And I'd been invited by a, a Syrian diplomat, actually, who was uh, in Pyongyang. Anyway, he ended up not being there when we visited there. We had a small group that went there. But um, I, I really had the least idea of what to expect in terms of countryside, the people, and so on. And on a first visit, I'm always really looking at detail, looking at everyday detail. You know, I can read about the history and the politics and so on, but when you first visit a country, I think uh, a lot of the detail, not to read too much into it, but still it does say something when you see something about the way people um, carry themselves, their confidence, you know, their education, um, a lot of little things like that. Um, so I was paying attention to that sort of detail in Korea, and I was quite surprised. One, the country is very lush, very green, very fertile. Um, it's uh, it, it's not at all the sort of the the country that's not growing food or anything like that that's suggested in in Western media. And secondly, people are very well educated and quite warm, and um, uh, uh, they have confidence in themselves, which really impressed me. And uh, and how about um, Iran? Uh, last year, 2017, was my first uh, visit to Tehran, actually. And uh, I was kind of busy with, with conferences and things when I was there. But uh, I, w I, was, I found it pretty striking. Uh, I, I found it to be the most hospitable. The people were mm. just amazing in terms of hospitality and yeah. the time they had for you. Very generous um, with, yeah. with their time as well. H how did you find that, that trip? Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, everyone that I've spoken to in the last couple of decades has remarked on how warm and hospitable and generous the Iranian people are. Um, of course, that's not the same as sort of going there and, and have experiencing that. I mean, I felt quite embarrassed, frankly, in Tehran. I had about 10 days in Iran and one week in Tehran. I couldn't spend a cent in Tehran. No one would let me buy anything, basically, mm -hmm. um, which is a little bit like, Arab countries, Arab people are very generous too, you know, but so I was in Iran trying to think, okay, these are Persian people, how are they How are they different a little bit culturally and so on, but certainly they're very generous. And Tehran 
is a big city. It's a mega city, you know, um, and so uh, it does have good metro and, and public transport, but things are very crowded. It's difficult to get around. So I spent a week there and visited um, a number of people and universities, and then I had a, a weekend too in Isfahan. Just, I just wanted to go to one second city. I know there's a lot of other big cities in Iran. Iran is a very big country. It has a lot of different peoples and um, languages too and, and cultures, but I just decided to go to two cities, Tehran and Isfahan. And Isfahan was really genuinely beautiful and, and it was a, a small enough city, you know, 2 million people instead of 12 million or whatever Tehran is, a small enough city to be able to sort of get an idea of the city and to see where its centre is and walk around and experience some of the history. So, yes, my experience with, with, with Tehran was also really influenced by the, the generosity and the warmth of the people and then also the the fact that it is very diverse and pluralistic. You know, a lot of things that you don't expect uh, you're going to see in, in Iran. Music, for example, incredible cultural history of music. They went to the Museum of Music in Isfahan. There's centuries and centuries of music there, which doesn't not always associated with uh, Muslim culture. And um, Christian culture too, very strong Christian culture in some parts of Iran too. So um, uh, I just take that as an opening visit basically because uh, it was just to try and experience a little bit of, of, of Iran. Mm. And uh, and l- likewise, um, Iraq. That was uh, this was the first year that I'd been to this country after having viewed it through a very uh, strange kaleidoscope over the last uh, twenty thirty years, uh, mainly through the U- U.S. media um, most mm. most of the time, and uh, after that um, through various other trouble and strife, uh, including the recent sort of ISIS crisis from two thousand fourteen forward. And uh, I was I. I, I just uh, love the people there. Uh, I thought the Iraqis were incredibly warm and very welcoming, um, incredibly politically adept as well, um, and just just kind people. But, um, you know, a little bit shocking, the state of the country, uh, considering all it's been through uh, over the last couple of decades, I'm not surprised, but, you know, obviously a big American presence a big American footprint, a military footprint, um, diplomatic mm. footprint, the size of their embassy, oh my goodness, and uh, the Green Zone, uh, is still pretty prominent. Uh, but it was a great experience. And how did you find that um, that experience? Well, there's certainly a, a big American footprint there. Um, I have to admit I was only there four days um, and to do with a conference where I, where I first met you there, in person at least. And... Um, our, my experience then was very limited to that conference, although the conference, as it was hosted by Hashd al-Shabi, the, the, the recent indigenous resistance movement in that country, um, it was quite an education in that group who showed us around and helped us get in that country and so on. Um, uh, I feel a bit deprived. I can't really speak about Iraq because I haven't even been extensively through Baghdad, let alone other parts of the country. But I got a very strong impression that there's a cultural American footprint there too. After all, we've been observing this country for almost four decades of war there, you know, the, all of the 80s really, the Iran-Iraq war, which the US orchestrated and fomented, of course, um, the first so-called Gulf War um, on Iraq and Kuwait. And it's uh, at the 90s, the sanctions of the 90s and so on, that country has been subject to the most terrible traumas of, of, of probably any country in the Middle East. I mean, you know, of course, we've got Yemen, we've got Palestine, but um, I think it's had a deep impact. I think all of that trauma has had a deep impact on the Iraqi mentality, but I don't want to try and say too much because I, I only had four days there, but I did notice some differences. It, it's hard not to make the comparison um, in my case, having been spent some time in a neighbouring uh, Arab country in Syria, and a big city uh, a little bit uh, comparable, such as Damascus, for example. Uh, the, the cultural differences are the ones that's, that, that struck me, really. Um, people's, the way people discuss the terrorism and the history and so on is rather more constrained. You know, we did see some public figures, Iraqi figures, um, ministers and um, academics and others talking there, and they're very constrained about the way that they talk about the American presence. W- would you agree with that? 
Yeah, I think so. Uh, they, they are married to, to, to a large extent. Um, and, you know, separating uh, Iraq and the United States uh, is, you know, that, that's not going to be an easy process if it ever happens at all because, you know, the United States occupied this country militarily, culturally, diplomatically for a long period of time, was effectively administering the country for a period of time, and now has set up a, a beachhead uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan uh, in Erbil, a pretty much a permanent military beachhead uh, and sort of intelligence agency beachhead uh, there inside of Iraq and inside the green zone. So that's a tough... That's a tough one. Um, but having said that, Tim, I, I, I find the new prime minister, uh, Alabadi, to be um, is as independent sounding and um, independent minded, it seems, uh, than any of the previous uh, uh, attempts at government uh, since the war. Uh, there's one other thing, Patrick, isn't there, that about the time we were there, uh, the Iraqi forces, the uh, the popular mobilization forces, Hashd al-Shabi, were securing the border, the northwestern border of Iraq, for the first time in almost three decades. In other words, that uh, Kurdistan region up there is under some pressures and going through some changes too because the Iraqi forces had simply not been along that border, that, that northern border, for ever since the uh, ever since the early 90s. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So the, there has been a shift as a result of the ISIS, uh, the defeat of ISIS, and the, ha- the rise and prominence of the Hashid, or the the PMUs, Pe- People's Mobilization Units, popular mobilization un- units um, there. So from from Iraq, from Iraq is a jump off point. Um, we're, I was going to segue into this conversation, looking back at 2017, looking forward to 2018. Just starting off with the concept of the multipolar world, and and I think Iraq Iraq is a good starting point for that conversation because effectively, for the first time, Tim, we have a bridge uh, connecting um, Syria and Iran uh, in 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 terms of friendly relations across across this part of the world. This potentially is, in my opinion, Tim, completely going to transform, if, if not, hasn't already, transforming the dynamics of this region yes. and the world. What, what do you think about I, this? I agree with you, and I, I think just to underline the point to listeners is that this is the first time that these practical, real um, cooperation crossing those three countries has uh, begun in four decades, basically, ever since the 1979 revolution in Iran. There have been constant attempts to pit all of those countries against each other and have wars in them. And uh, this this uh, recent terrorist group, Daesh, uh, or ISIS, being defeated this year has, has made an enormous change. And, you know, you see little things that seem normal, could be normal everyday things, but they're not. They're landmarks. For example, uh, Iranian aid for Syria arriving across the Iraqi border there, for example, into eastern Syria, you know, at least the... the the, the popular resistance forces taking the Iraqi border, the northwest Iraqi border, it seems like a, a normal sort of thing, but it hasn't been there. It hasn't happened for, for decades. And so the, the prospects, for example, the people I think are now talking about the, a highway or a, a, a rail, uh, these transport links between Tehran and Beirut, for example, those four countries linking up and having productive relationships, you know, um, a lot of people in Western countries... Uh, miss the fact that uh, the so-called South-South cooperation countries in uh, the Middle East, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, have tremendous potential to improve their possibilities, uh, you know, including their economic possibilities by by cooperation. And that cooperation is damaged through colonialism and wars and so on. So I agree. I think what's happened in Iraq is a watershed for the region. I mean, there's been a lot of symbolic events along the way, um, such as the Russians placing the intelligent gathering centre against Daesh in Baghdad um, at a time when the US was trying, still trying to pretend that they are dominating or in control of the anti-terrorist forces in the region. In fact, the Russians put that in Baghdad for a reason to flag that the cooperation between Iran, Iraq, Syria, uh, Lebanon and Russia was um, an important Feature and now we see the fruits of that with Daesh being defeated in Iraq and Syria at the end of end of 2017, 
and um, the fruits of that defeat. Some types of normal cooperation can begin to happen again and those countries can begin to, in particular Iraq, um, rise out of the ashes, as it were, and assert its independence for the first time in a, in a very long time and have good neighbourly cooperation with its neighbours. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, uh, and so from, from, from there, from the Middle East and then up to, to Russia, in terms of East-West uh, dynamics, um, it, you know, if I'm sitting here having this conversation in the United States, uh, obviously, people in America are feeling that the world, you know, the United States is at the center of the global map and the world more or less revolves around the United States. And it's hard not to think that, Tim, uh, when you're standing in downtown Manhattan and just seeing the scale of the power and wealth uh, in that country or when you're in Washington, D.C., uh, same sort of thing, or Los Angeles, uh, you know, America is still a, a powerful country, uh, it still has a lot of economic and military muscle, but it's missing something, Tim, uh, and that is this sort of respect factor, because I've always argued, Tim, that this is where a country, a superpower will ultimately, or any ruling body will always derive the most of its power uh, over the long term as being uh, viewed by its peers or neighbors as an honest broker, someone that you can trust, someone you can do business with. But now, in 2018, as we tick over into the new year, this is a thing of the past with the United States. I think, Tim, that's the most significant thing that is going to create the power vacuum uh, is how people view the United States is just not the same as it was before. Yeah, I agree that there's a big change going on there. I mean, in terms of the United States, first of all, it's a world in itself. It's a big country like some other big countries, Russia, India, Iran even. These are big countries with tremendous diversity and they can survive by themselves more or less. The difference with the US is that it's had this... Um, evangelistic type of approach to its role in the world and it's played that role for better or for worse for many decades in the 20th century and that power is frankly running out um, and it's running out relatively quickly and I suppose you could say that the, the manner in which the US uh, state is managed has a bearing on how quickly and how disgracefully that that decline in power will happen. Um, certainly there's a huge defeat that's, ha that's happened for the US in the Middle East um, with the, the, the collapse of Daesh, with the collapse of the other terrorist groups, which, um, let's be frank about it, um, without um, you know, adopting the agenda of the, uh, the media in the US, the US has been behind every single one of these terrorist groups, directly or indirectly, and the evidence these days shows that it's been directly in most cases, but we should rather say overtly or covertly that they are the two uh, proper qualifiers, I think, for the relationship between the US and the terrorist groups. It's played that gambit to try and divide and destabilise the region. Uh, it's failed at great cost in the sense that the influence of the US in the region is certainly in serious decline. Uh, there are some illusions about this now. I see, uh, what's his name, General Mattis, saying recently that they want to stay on in Syria and do this and that and the other thing. After Daesh is gone, well, uh, the US is used to creating new pretexts in this sort of way, but frankly it's not going to last very long because they have running out of pretexts. You know, they, they simply can't sustain uh, this last pretext. So in Iraq, I think it's a bit of pill to swallow for any US administration, and it's not like... It's a bipartisan issue here because there seem to be some collective illusions circulating in, in Washington. I, I noticed, for example, that the, um, the recent move to um, or to the, the recent declaration that the US Embassy is going to move to Jerusalem was unopposed in the US Senate. People blame Trump for this, but really it was there were 90 in support of it in the Senate and 10 abstained and no one opposed it in June 2017 when that went to the Senate. Now, that was based on a US law from 1995, 22 years old, but for one reason or another, administrations hadn't acted on it for a long time, presumably diplomatic considerations about the image of the, the US in the region. Uh, the current President Trump doesn't he seem to have such great sensitivities about the damage he might do to the US image in the region. But in any case, the point I'm making is that there's a, there's a very strong consensus in US politics, which is uh, 
quite antithetical to uh, peoples in many countries. Um, what's the other example? The sanctions on Russia. That was, had overwhelming support in, um, in the Congress, um, uh, way ahead of Trump or behind Trump, if you, if you like, um, in the sense that Trump wanted to do some sort of diplomacy or deal-breaking with Russia, wasn't able to do it because the, the bipartisan approach to sanctions on Russia were so widely supported. But what's it going to do? It's already being resented in, in Europe. It's one of the reasons for a growing disquiet with the role of the US in Europe, the fact that the US is trying to impose these sanctions, which are going to affect Europeans' relationships with Russia. So there's some sort of large collective illusions going on in the US which have a lot to do with its its actual decline in power in not just the Middle East, but uh, in, in Europe, I believe, also. And and uh, just fr- from the Jerusalem point, we'll, we'll look at this for a second. Uh, beyond Donald Trump, uh, the how this is viewed on, in the United Nations forum, uh, the sort of display that was yep. put put on by Nikki Haley before Christmas, uh, when the vote came up um, on Jerusalem at the UN General yep. Assembly, and the tantrum and the threats, the blackmail, we're taking names. Uh, yeah. you, you, you know, we'll, we won't forget what you've you stabbed us in the back and this is our national sovereign interests and almost talking yeah. like they're a total surrogate of Israel. Um, yeah. and, and this was embarrassing on many levels, but for, I think you talked about the, you use the term collective illusion. Um, there, mm-hmm. be, under this spell of collective illusion, I don't think there is a kind of embarrassment by people that are completely immersed, uh, be they neoconservatives, be they uh, Christian Zionists, be they Republicans that are just cashing their IPAC check uh, every year, like Marco Rubio or Tom Cotton or people like this, they, 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 are, they really don't care uh, what the world thinks about the United States, how they're viewed and how they behave diplomatically. I found it complete a, you know a total affront to everything that the UN is kind of there for which is it's a forum to you know settle disputes basically that was put in place after uh two great world wars and here we yeah. have the US threatening to pull funding from it because they don't like almost like kicking and screaming like petulant children that's the best way i can describe it tim yeah I'm not sure whether they don't care, you know, but they, they, they live in their own world to a degree. Uh, I think probably in the long run they do care um, if, if indeed, you know, larger parts of the world reject them than, than already do. But it was certainly a slap in the face, wasn't it, that vote? First of all, in the Security Council, they had no support, not one support in the Security Council on the Jerusalem issue. Well, they had 128, was it, against them in the General Assembly? Yes, um, yes. Most of the rest were abstaining. In other words, you know, I don't want to buy into this. And, you know, um, typical um, weak states, basically, that, that really wanted to sit on the fence there. They had very little support there uh, and nothing in the Security Council. So it was, it, it was quite a slap in the face. And to, okay, you know, to threaten countries, that's one thing. They've done that for a long time, of course. Maybe they haven't done it as overtly and as crudely now. I think that seems to be at the root of some of the maybe a fair part of the discontent with, with President Trump in the U.S. is that in many respects, President Trump is business as usual. But he does it in a very vulgar, crass sort of way, which is, uh, seems to rub the wrong way against the self-image of a lot of North Americans. I think that might be um, what they uh, resent to a degree now. There's a great continuity in U.S. politics, Patrick. I mean, we can chart a lot of important policies from... Clinton through Bush through Obama to Trump um, with, with great continuity, extraordinary continuity, you know. But, of course, the the differences, particularly the, dim, the, the differences in image and um, perhaps how that reflects on self-image seem to be the ones that motivate uh, people in North America. Yeah, I mean, for, speaking as an American, that, that that was that's my ambassador to the United Nations, uh, <clears throat> Nikki Haley from South Carolina. It's just a really hard thing to swallow uh, on many levels. But you know, Samantha Power wasn't uh, any better, uh, really. Some of the things that uh, she did, and neither was John Bolton before that. So uh, this is a problematic position uh, in American politics uh, for a lot of people, unfortunately. But um, mm-hmm. But, you know, from from there, uh, let's go to the Far East. Uh, now, you've, you've been to the Korean Peninsula. Uh, 
this year. Um, in terms of the multipolar aspect, uh, 2017 was a huge year for China, um, and it, I, I think, solidified the sort of preeminence of uh, their leader, Xi, uh, who's now become in some ways kind of a cultural icon, uh, definitely a mainstay in the political structure there. Uh, could You could be looking at one of the sort of maybe one of the go-to people on the world stage uh, in the next few years. How are you looking at this in the multipolar uh, setup right now? Well, China plays a funny role, doesn't it? Because in many respects, it's crippled politically, in my view, by its codependence with the US. Um, the China, despite its economic power, and what is it that I think it's... Um, it's going to surpass the size of the U.S. economy soon. If it hasn't already, people calculate these things in different ways. The European economy is actually the biggest economy in the world these days, so um, presumably China is going to surpass the European Union and the U.S. will be number three there. But So the, the economic power of, of China is unquestioned, um, but uh, it really has been hesitant to uh, challenge the U.S. on particular strategic issues um, and in my view, it's mainly because of this great economic uh, codependence. That is to say that the, the export market of the Chinese, uh, the, the amount, the size of the trade surplus that China has with, with the US is such a great motivator to keep doing business and keep doing it the same and not disrupting that smooth business relationship. If there were not that degree of codependence, if, for example, China's export markets were more genuinely diversified in the world, probably it might have a more independent foreign policy, but maybe this is something too far down the track, I don't know. For whatever reason, of course, it's been Russia that's taken the initiatives, Russia, which is not as economically as powerful, uh, a confident country, the biggest, geographically speaking, by far the biggest country in the world. They've never had territorial ambitions than anyone else. They've got so much territory. But... Um, uh, it's Russia that's taken these independent initiatives, isn't it? And therefore, the, uh, the the world standing in terms of statesmanship, if you like, or um, uh, resolving international conflicts, it's fallen to Mr. Putin, um, very experienced um, operator in, in 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 Russia, and not to Mr. Mr. Z. So um, there, there's a dilemma, I think, uh, for China to the extent to which its self-image as a leader in the world is important. I'm not sure to what extent that's the case. Um, China has always considered itself the centre of the world, so maybe, um, you know, they view the world in a different way. But um, I just make that observation that it's interesting, isn't it, that Russia, um, it's a strong country economically and in many respects, but it's been Russia that's been taking these initiatives. And now this new sort of Cold War we have, while the US is... Uh, extremely wary of China and sees China as its, you know, a, a potential competitor and has this policy of trying a new containment policy on China. It's really been uh, Russia that's shaken them up in terms of their, certainly in terms of their Middle East strategy, but also to a fair degree in terms of the Latin American strategy too. It's been Russia that's been there defending Venezuela, for example, with a strong relationship with Cuba. In other words, being a, a counterweight um, to the U.S. ambitions in, in Latin America also. And ch so China's One Belt, uh, One Road uh, project, this, this isn't merely uh, you know, a, land, a land trade route from uh, Beijing and Shanghai uh, th through to sort of mainland Europe. It's more than that, Tim. Uh, it's a series of other uh, tributaries and uh, trade routes uh, that are connecting seaports and in countries like Myanmar. Uh, these are overland and over-the-mountain routes uh, through Pakistan connecting uh, to the Indian Ocean. Uh, so mm -hmm. it, it's a really uh, sophisticated uh, initiative and includes Africa. It includes actually South America. Uh, and also uh, Chinese are building. A lot of people aren't aware uh, while everyone's been twiddling their thumbs, uh, Chinese have been building a, uh, a, a another canal in in uh, Central America. It's uh, cutting 
cutting through uh, Lake Nicaragua. So, right. so you know, looking at this project, are we looking at the potential here? You spoke about the U.S. not wanting to be, or China not wanting to be in direct confrontation um, with each mm-hmm. other overtly, but could we see a series of proxy uh, conflicts that mainly motivated by the U.S. wanting to possibly disrupt uh, China's economic hegemony globally uh, through this Belt and Road initiatives? Well, you're right to identify that uh, that Belt and Road um, initiative as the most important infrastructure development in the world. Um, it's no doubt that it's not just about linking to Europe, it's also the the emerging economies in, in Eurasia. Um, you mentioned Pakistan. Also, there's a – now the Russia and Iran have this uh, multi-billion dollar link um, uh, through the Caucasus, you know, from, from north to south there. Um, Middle Eastern countries, Asian countries uh, all have potential links there and there are have some implications in other continents. So it's a massively important thing. To some extent, strategically, it's, it's avoiding this – idea that the U.S. has that it can somehow um, contain China through the sea, through sea power in some sort of way, constrain it and its trade routes. Um, uh, And that, of course, has implications for the the geopolitics of Southeast and Northeast Asia. I mean, one reason, for example, why the Chinese, who um, the North Koreans don't have a a huge regard for these days because they regard them as having become businessmen, basically. But the, China certainly doesn't want another U.S. proxy on its northern border where North Korea is now. So to that extent, there's a type of a symbiosis there that whatever the Chinese current relationship with uh, with North Korean government is, they're going to be very jealous of not letting the U.S. install another puppet on the, on the South Korean, on the Korean peninsula, I should say. So, yes, this huge infrastructure project is important. It's it's way out of the hands of the U.S. to do anything about it. There's no question that the U.S. can um, stall it or stop it. The surprising thing, perhaps, is that the U.S. hasn't retreated further into its own sphere and tried to perhaps concentrate on certain areas that it might have some influence in. You mentioned the second canal in, in Central America going through Nicaragua. That was a thing that uh, the U.S. fought wars about in the, in the not-too-distant past or for almost a century, really, um, and uh, it created the state of Panama to stop Colombia having influence over that canal, for example. Um, and yet it, it seems to have... Uh, maybe this is one of the chronic problems of declining U.S. power, that it spread itself very thin. Perhaps every empire does this. Maybe it's the hubris, you know, the, the arrogance of an empire to think that they can carry on with such a large number of operations at once when their economic power is in decline and has been in decline for, for quite some time. Um, it, it doesn't have the capacity to maintain its influence in Iraq, in South America, in the way that it, it, that it thought it had. The, remember the project of the Free Trade Area of the Americas? That failed 12 years ago. Um, the late Hugo Chavez took a shovel to Argentina to make the symbolic point that he was burying the free trade area of the Americas in Argentina mm-hmm. back in 2005, you know. So there were a series of losses there, despite the fact that there's some new right-wing governments in in uh, in Latin America and there's some attempts to get back on the rails, some type of um, uh, neoliberal type of coalition. It's not really cutting that deep, and it's really been undermined by the fact that the US is trying to maintain this image, this illusion that it's really... Um, you know, the big hegemon in the world that is dominating the world. There are some people, you know, that say that the US has never been that hegemon. It never really dominated the world. But the, the decline of that power is increasingly apparent, I think. And, uh, you know, just shifting down quickly to, to Latin America, since since we're down there, uh, and certainly in Central America, you've got potential for uh, a lot of upheaval, uh, instability in Guatemala. We've got N- Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, all targets uh, of coups uh, in the recent past and potentially uh, in the next year, specifically Nicaragua there. Um, that could have something to do with possibly what we were talking about before, but it's also still, there, there's also this resurgence of um, not just, uh, along with anti-Russian or this sort of neo-McCarthyist um, political dialectic, which has emerged as the dominant sort of bogeyman in American 
um, politics and international politics. There's also this resurgence talking point of, um, you know, fighting communism. I'm starting to see this coming up in 2017 uh, along the sort of alt-right um, sort of pathways of conversation. So, uh, a- a- again, this brings a kind of a justification for CIA activity, doing what it always has done best, which is to tear countries in Central and South America to pieces uh, um, under the pretext of some ideological threat, when in really it was about establishing corporate beachheads for United, mm. United States corporations in South America. So th- this is now coming back. Uh, certainly Venezuela is front and center in this conversation, but Brazil could be uh, after the next elections as well. Uh, we, you know, Let's wait and see, but you know, how do you see this shaping up? Do you see a return to the 1970s uh, in terms of the U.S. relationship with uh, South America coming up? Uh, no, I don't see a return to the 1970s. I mean, you mentioned Brazil. Let's remember it was a type of a coup in Brazil that led to the current regime there. It doesn't have any great legitimacy at all, the, the current government in, in Brazil. Let's not go into all the history now, but the election promises something a little bit better, I believe, for Brazil. The, in Central America, though, of course, you're, you're right to draw attention to that. There, that, that has been the, the side of the most vulnerable governments. Um, the, they've been the poorest countries. They've got terrible cultures of crime and violence. They're very dependent on remittances from the US. So there's been that, that with, with a few exceptions, you know, the, the, the breakthrough of the FMLN government in, um, in El Salvador and the resurgence of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. We saw that coup in, in Honduras um, several years back and uh, accusations of fraud recently. So Central America is, is a very vulnerable Spot and of course, what it, I think the, after Israel and the US, the one government was at Guatemala that, that followed to announce that they were going to be a humiliating statement to announce they were going to move their embassy to to Jerusalem. I mean, who really cares <laughs> where Guatemala moves its Jerusalem moves its embassy anywhere? Really, you know, it's a humiliating thing that <laughs> these little countries, um, you know. The governments of these countries, I should say, you know, the people don't deserve these governments, but it was usually in the past Honduras or Guatemala that would be, for example, a beachhead for the invasion of Cuba or uh, a government that was uh, taking on the task of um, carrying the can for some disgraceful initiative um, against one of the other Latin American countries in the United Nations, you know. Mm-hmm. It's a very sad history there. There have been some vindications, and I think the only future vindication uh, for them and for Latin America has precisely been this project of unifying the region, which the late President Fidel Castro and the late President Hugo Chavez did a great deal for. That still remains. There still is the the ALBA, the, the Bolivarian Alliance of the Americas. There still is CELAC, the the 33-country alliance of 600 million people in the Americas. There's still UNASUR. Those big regional organisations still exist, and that means that a number of conflicts, um, not all of them, but a number of conflicts are being worked out amongst the Latins themselves. And that's where I think where Latin America is ahead of the Middle East, for example. They have made that sort of progress, and it's much harder for the US to do what it did back in the 70s. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And in terms of, you know, the big conversation uh, that's dominated uh, uh, geopolitics for really post-World War II has been the nuclear conversation uh, and the, this, the concept of the nuclear deterrent. Uh, and no other country right now is as front and center probably as North Korea uh, in this conversation, and certainly people will argue the United States is, needs an adversary. They need a sort of number one enemy nemesis uh, in order to justify what's looking like next year, uh, in, by some people's estimations, a U.S. defense budget that's going to exceed, uh, believe it or not, $1 trillion uh, by some recent reports. It's already broken records uh, north of... 700 billion and that's just what's on the books so north korea where does it stand uh in your opinion and th- in terms of the nuclear deterrent issue um is it in the clear i mean having a nuclear deterrent i mean 
proponents will argue that that does uh, allow a degree of independence for a country to have a nuclear deterrent. At the same time, uh, North Korea being condemned for pursuing that strategy. Um, and then Japan is an interesting actor uh, because J- Japan is also uh, potentially a breakout country. It could become a nuclear power. This could swing uh, the balance of power in the UN Security Council one day if Japan was to enter that f- fold. How are you looking at this situation? Well, I'm not sure about Japan, but I can say with North Korea, and I heard from a couple of people when I was there earlier this year, that um, they look at what happened in Libya and what happened in Iraq in terms of these negotiating disarmament, and they think those people were stupid. You know, They were weak. They're not going to go down that path, basically. Um, they negotiated some form of disarmament. They were invaded and destroyed. They were smashed. The states were crushed. And the peoples were... were the, the, the social structures of those countries of Iraq and Libya were destroyed and they see that that process of negotiating um, your own disarmament was just negotiating the destruction of your own country and it's understandable, I think a lot of people understand that now North Korea, let's remember, or let's say independent Korea because it's the one part of the Korean Peninsula that wasn't colonised, it wasn't uh, completely subsumed in US culture and that meant a military dictatorship it didn't mean any sort of freedom there. There's a lot of freedom South Korean people don't have now. There's a lot, there are people in jail for wanting to um, talk to North Koreans and so on. But there's a groundswell in South Korea for reunification. So I think in terms of the way the North Koreans see it, um, they respond in kind. You know, they have a different approach to diplomacy to other countries. Uh, if the US comes at them aggressively, and remember they've been at war for over a century and they defeated the Japanese, uh, they defeated the Americans in 1953. I didn't understand until I saw the war museum there really what it meant, that war, that they say 4 million Koreans were killed. Uh, more bombs were dropped on Pyongyang than there, are, than there were people in that city, more than 400,000. Uh, they reconstructed. Um, the US had to sign an armistice but not a peace agreement, which was just a uh, an armistice. Um, uh, and and the general that signed it said this is the first time we've ever done this and failed to achieve any of our military objectives. So the Koreans fought them to a standstill there, basically a little bit the way that Hezbollah fought Israel to a standstill just 11 years ago. And what's happened, I think each time the US has made a move on North Korea, they've backed off because maybe it's some small comfort here that although we've had some pretty serious criminals in the White House, they're not all stupid. And to their credit, let's say, as a backhand compliment, uh, they haven't done stupid things with nuclear weapons for a number of decades. And um, I think the the North Koreans understand that. And I think that Washington, deeply in the state, they understand that too. I saw some memo from someone in the CIA recently that said they know exactly what uh, uh, Kim Jong-un wants. He's not mad. He's very rational. He wants us to get out of the Korean Peninsula and he wants a peace treaty. And that's what the North Koreans say there too. So fortunately, um, you know, this thing is, because there are some cooler heads on all sides, this thing is not escalating. But the talk, of course, goes on and the talk scares people, basically. Um, the, the, that danger has always been there and the danger has been mainly from the Washington, frankly, because Washington is the one side that has always rejected the... It refused to say that they would not make a unilateral or a, or, or a preemptive strike. Um, I think in the past the Soviet Union said they wouldn't do that. I think now the, the North Koreans are saying they might do it, but they're matching the rhetoric effectively with the Americans there. So I think in, in, in some strange sort of way, the, the nuclear program in North Korea is going to be a stabilising force, you know, but how is Washington going to respond? I mean... Uh, President Putin was saying not too long ago that um, they had some understandings some years back. What happened to those understandings? There was even talks. There were two summits between North and South Korea about reunification. And the understanding on the nuclear issue was that North Korea would stop it um, if there were a de-escalation of all of the military operations and uh, provocations and so on that the US did on the peninsula. And there was a little bit of normalisation going on there early this century and it's disappeared it's disappeared yeah. but um yeah 
I'm not as pessimistic as as some others about um, the future of the of the conflict there because. Uh, strangely enough, I think that in Washington they're not that mad. Yeah, well, I, I hope you're right, Tim. But you know, unfortunately, uh, uh, people at CNN and some of these um, highly irresponsible media outlets in America have basically been running all this week um, biological weapons uh, stories. So North Korea is harboring WMDs, um, yeah. uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and you know, just ba- the basic fear mongering script. No, you're right, Patrick. But bear this in mind: they've been doing that. For 65 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you think the scares in the 50s were not crazy stuff? People in the US were getting under tables, you know, to brace for a nuclear explosion in the 50s. <laughs> this stuff has been going on for a very long time. Yes, yes. Well, let, let, let's hope that the, this rhetoric um, uh, just remains that, just rhetoric. Uh, and certainly, um, if, if Korea was to unify as a peninsula, um, this would I don't know what that would do with the United States pretext to basically have military occupation of Japan, which they effectively do, uh, and all of the other sort of military uh, footprints that they have on the Pacific Rim. Uh, it's really North Korea that's their main justification uh, for that operation. And if that does ceases to become a, an issue or a threat, uh, then they really have no reason um, to be there militarily in the Pacific. Well, that's right. They, they lose a foothold. They've occupied South Korea for all this time, you know, more than longer than I've been alive, and I'm not very young. Um, they've occupied militarily South Korea all this time. Um, they want that foothold, just as they're trying to hang on to the foothold in northern Syria and northern Iraq. They're trying to hang on to those footholds, but they're, it's becoming increasingly tenuous in, in the Middle East. And now, of course, you're right, if, if, they, if there were... Uh, if the peace talks flourished, let's say, the, the reunification talks flourished as the ones, I think it was 2000, 2007, two summits between the leaders of the, of the two parts. Uh, and there's a very strong, here's another thing about visiting Korea, there's a very strong cultural bond there. They are the same people. You know, it's, it's a long history. It's a language. It's uh, an identification that it's not even destroyed by all of the politics of the last, um, whatever it is, three generations, you know. There, there is a very strong sense of, of being Korean. It's quite different to um, you know, being Chinese or being Russian or being Japanese. So that shared ambition for reunification is not going away. But at the same time, as you pointed out, it's going to be a, a threat to the, the, the military foothold that the U.S. has in that part. And that part means uh, for the military, for the U.S. military also, that its stance in relation to China, which is very important, and that's the big paranoia they have, that the power of China is going to displace them as the big power, certainly in that part of the world. And uh, in, in, in 2017, we saw some amazing uh, twists and turns, and one of them is this kind of formation of the uh, anti-Iranian coalition of Israel, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and of course behind them the United States uh, and their other Gulf GCC countries, and then Qatar being ejected uh, from the fold on the Korean Peninsula. And so you have Iran, Qatar, uh, Turkey, um, all participating in the Astana um, peace process for with Syria. Uh, so uh, uh, potentially this rearranging, if you will, of interests there, um, the split of the GCC, the two preeminent powers being Qatar and Saudi Arabia, Arabia, um, hmm. how's this going to shape up coming? Because it's not a nat- is it a natural alliance uh, between t- Turkey, Iran, Qatar, uh, and Syria? I know it's problematic because of what Turkey has done, the, the role Turkey's played in destroying um, half of Syria. It's it, that, that's a tenuous relationship, but uh, with Russia uh, kind of shepherding. Um, the process, uh, it does have potential for success. Um, how are you looking at this incredibly complex dynamic here? Yes, it is complex, and I think the Astana talks uh, have, have shifted the whole international uh, focus of discussion on the peace process in Syria because it's a necessary one, uh, not because the foreign powers are going to have anything to say about really the real political outcome in Syria. They've lost militarily. They're not going to substitute that with some fancy tricks of diplomacy. But it's important that 
the diplomatic role of Russia and Iran in particular have been very deft in the, in this process because Turkey, of course, you remember, oh, at least uh, Erdogan, not really to speak of Turkey because Turkey is an important nation, but the government of Erdogan um, was very strongly committed to this Muslim Brotherhood project. And the Muslim Brotherhood project, shared with Qatar, of course, um, is a horrific um, ideological project. It's uh, sectarian as hell. It, it's expressed um, open support for and practice of genocide against um, non-extremist uh, uh, Sunni Muslims, for example. Um, remember the government of Qatar put billions of dollars into the early Salafist groups in, in Syria mm -hmm. that were chopping people's heads off um, uh, mainly because they were worked for the government, but also because they were in other religious sects, for example. It's vehemently anti-Shia, and yet Iran was mature enough to have a pathway for Qatar to jump into its arms, let's say, because Qatar's a tiny little petrol state and Iran's a big nation. But Iran immediately opened up the door for Qatar once the, the young, brash, I call him the clown prince of Saudi Arabia, made that stupid move to try and discipline his partner. I mean, the things um, aggressors do when they're failing, you know, the, the Saudi regime has been very uh, frustrated at its failures in Iraq and Syria in particular, and it's made a number of stupid decisions. But when they moved against Qatar because of this, it's a longer-term rivalry that's been there between the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia and the Muslim Brotherhood because although they share an ideology, there's always been this type of competition because the, the Saudi uh, royal family has always been rather jealous of competition in uh, that type of sectarian genocidal stakes with the Muslim Brotherhood based in Egypt and and, uh, and Turkey and, um, and Syria, uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood has a genuine cross-national network and it's potentially a threat to Saudi power. Anyway, they cooperated well enough to support all these groups in Syria and Iraq for many years, and then this uh, young, brash um, prince, um, MBS, decides to try and crack the whip on Qatar. It doesn't work, and uh, Turkey backs up Qatar. So the whole alliance between Turkey, Qatar and Saudis, which had been the major uh, regional sponsors of the terrorist groups, fell apart, basically. As they were losing, they fell apart. Um, so the fact that Qatar has been, in a sense, seduced into the Astana process by the Russians and, you know, seduced into the idea that there's a future for them with their ga all of their gas and so on. Remember, some people were saying at the beginning of the, the Syrian conflict this was to do with a terrible competition between gas pipeline projects from Qatar and Iran. Mm -hmm. Well, now what's happening, they're talking to each other and, in fact, Qatar's become quite economically dependent on Iran. Maybe they could do something together in the gas fields. Of course, Russia is the other, the other third leg there, really, that Russia, Qatar and Iran are one, two, three in the gas supplying stakes there. Now they're together and the U.S. is out. Um, and Russia, at the Geneva process, where the U.S. and the Europeans thought they were going to dictate political terms to Syria, Russia is now saying, well, just a minute, the Syrian opposition isn't just these bunch of exiles that are coming out of Riyadh. There's a whole lot of Syrians, actually, who've been in the civil opposition who have been excluded. We're going to include them in the, in the Geneva process. So we're going to see some interesting things, I think, in 2018 in that peace process talk because the matter, frankly, has been uh, almost taken out of the hands of the Americans. And, and do you see the center of gravity on the Syria uh, peace process? Do you see Astana being the center of gravity on that, or is, is it going to go back to Geneva, or is this is it going to kind of languish somewhere in the middle? And you've got two, well, the U.S. and its its partners trying to impose uh, some kind of an, a political outcome there, while a whole different process uh, is going on with with Russia and Syria and Iran and Turkey uh, and those parties at the on the Astana table how, how can can they reconcile these two things or is this indicative of the new multipolar world right now well yeah yeah to your last question yes um that's true um there are other forces at play that are as important or more important than the u.s so it's not that astana is like the final word in things it's just that astana represents a process that was set up by the alliance which is um you say the regional resistance group uh, plus Russia, um, and 
that's really outflanked um, the Geneva process. It may well go back to Geneva, but you see the, the say that the, the US coalition, the US and what Britain and France in particular, the two former colonial powers in the region, and Britain still, we, we saw, didn't we, Patrick, in, in Baghdad, that Britain still has this traditional sort of role in Iraq. It, 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 it imagines it, but the Iraqis also host it, and there's a lot of exiled Iraqis in Britain and so on. So, But the role in the Syria talks there for Britain and France has diminished seriously. So whether that gets resolved in Geneva or Astana is neither here nor there, except that it's going, the, the, the Russians and, um, and the Syrian allies have all <clears throat> agreed to continue with the UN processes and the UN has an important centre in, in Geneva. I think the, the point I'm trying to make is that um, the, the shots are, being, are not being called by the anti-Syrian forces these days. You saw the most recent uh, 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 discussion in Geneva led to the Syrian side, led by Ambassador Bashar al jafri simply walking out. They said that there weren't reasonable people to talk to, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the the, the UN um, agent, the um, the representative of the, of the Secretary General and the British and the Americans were saying, oh, and the Assad government has to come here and talk and so on. No, they don't. They don't when they've won on the battlefield, they don't have to... Uh, go and talk to a bunch of unreasonable uh, <laughs> jihad, jihadist representatives who demand that they all commit suicide and hand over the government to uh, a Riyadh-based al-Qaeda group. <laughs> they don't have to do that anymore if they ever, they never really thought of doing it, but now their, their hand is much stronger there. So the hand of the alliance of Iran, Syria, Iraq, uh, in the important parts of Lebanon and Russia is enormously strengthened and, and they're calling the shots now. And I think... At some stage, there will be some UN process, probably in Geneva, that will um, provide, to put it this way, because uh, certainly uh, President Putin has always seen it this way, that he is offering a way out for the US, which, as they say, trapped up the proverbial tree without an apparent exit with grace, you know, without losing in disgrace a way to try and claim credit for a, a loss and, and turn a, a, a humiliating loss into some sort of compensatory victory. Um, so there's there's diplomatic goodwill there, let's say, for Washington, but um, is it capable of seizing that? Mm. I'm not sure. Well, the, you know, the conversations I've had with U.S. Um, uh, former officials um, on this subject is we'll spend a whole hour uh, arguing about uh, you know what the U.S. needs to do to support the Syrian Kurds and their bid for uh, independence and carving out a, a Kurdish state inside Syria. I mean, that's as far as you get on the conversation or the analysis. Um, yeah. and, and so that what, what we're talking about here is is, is a much richer uh, tapestry of things going on, and I just. I'm, I'm really struggling to see anybody in the American side. I'm, I'm hoping this year they'll emerge, uh, like, say, voices of reason, really just finally abandoning uh, what is really a losing agenda uh, that was mm. started under President Obama with uh, around Syria. Um, but I, I, at the moment, I don't yet see it, Tim. Um, they're still obsessed with Syrian Kurds and somehow breaking up Syria. Yeah, the, the second point, the second part is the point, isn't it? They don't care about Syrian Kurds or Turkish Kurds. A lot of them are, are Turkish Kurds. Remember coming, trying to support their project from the north. That's why the US is getting so little agreement with Turkey or President Erdogan on this on this issue. They don't care about Kurds at all, really. But they certainly want to keep their foot in the region. We're back to the, you know, foot in the door, and the Kurds offer them that pretext there. But you saw, as well as I did in Iraq, how quickly that evaporated in Iraq when Iraqi forces went into um, Kirkuk. Remember, just before we, before we arrived in Baghdad, they went through in two hours, I think, or one and a half hours. Mm -hmm. No resistance at all. One, one car blew itself up. That was it. There was no resistance at all. The, the, they fled back to Erbil, and um, within a couple of days, uh, the, the president of Iraqi Kurdistan, Barzani, had resigned. Now, Iraq had been weakened. The state had been smashed. The constitution was changed. There was a federal-type structure. Uh, none of those things have happened in Syria. I don't think that whole project, uh, the Kurdish project in Syria, is going to last very long. And they're talking tough about it uh, because it's the last 
option that's still there for the Americans. They've built a few air bases there. But I just, frankly, uh, maybe I'm, I'm making too trivial of it because people are, are going to die in this whole process. But look at these things. We haven't seen any serious conflict between the Syrian Kurds yet and the Syrian army, but the Syrian army is losing its patience. Um, and the Syrian army has very strong backers, as we know, um, the commitment of the U.S. to that region is very limited. They didn't back up the Iraqi Kurds at all, nothing. Mm -hmm. They even rejected their, their, their independence project when they put it to a vote, even though they got a strong vote in support of it. The U.S. wouldn't, wouldn't support them there. Perhaps they were trying to keep some credibility with Baghdad, I'm not sure. But I really don't think that the Kurdish option in Syria has much future. And I don't think that you I think I suspect in this coming year in 2018, the US will, will be out of Syria almost entirely, except for some covert groups, basically. I think that that uh, that Kurdistan option in Syria is going to collapse very quickly. Yeah, it's it, Kurds are not a monolithic uh, uh, block in Syria either. The Afrin Kurds are very pro-Russian. Um, there are uh, friendly with with the Syrian government, certain factions of of Syrian the Syrian Kurdish population. So it's not um, easy uh, for the U.S. to maneuver that. Um, but oh. the big gaping wound uh, in in 2018 still, Tim, is Yemen. And uh, I just want to wrap up our. Uh, great conversation here with two, two two issues. The first is Yemen. Um, is this when is this wound uh, going to close? Uh, will it will it heal this year or in the coming years? And the, and lastly, I want to talk about Palestine and the symbolism the symbolism of it. But uh, in terms of Yemen, um, I thought 2017 Tim was going to be the year that they would sort of put the brakes on this uh, horrific, uh, which is bordering on. I don't want to use the term genocide because uh, this gets thrown around uh, too much these days. But what's going on in Yemen is as bad uh, as anything that I've seen uh, in terms of military undeclared wars of aggression before. What are we going to see, do you think, in 2018? Well, you're right to, to say how bad it is. It's not just uh, the war which the Saudis have been making no progress with at all. Um, at, at great cost to the, to the Yemeni people, but the economic and sea blockade that's going on, which has deliberately uh, sabotaged payments for imports of food and food importations themselves, the transport links are throttled, and a lot of the, the starvation going on in Yemen at the moment, and starvation, you know, always leads to huge epidemics. So they've had cholera and, um, and the, the malnutrition bad malnutrition situation of many millions of people is going to contribute to many, many deaths from preventable diseases there, mainly children. We know that. Uh, it's very clear. There's very little pressure being put on the Saudis. No one wants to really openly support them, but covertly, of course, the US is still selling the weapons. My country, Australia, is selling them weapons too. Britain selling them weapons. Uh, I'm not sure about France. Maybe they are too. So, they don't want to say much publicly, but, of course, we know, you know, very, the U.S. supports them very strongly. This is the one, by the way, genuine revolution of the, the 21st century, the, you might say the so-called Arab Spring, which the Saudis in particular wanted to crush. It's been complicated by the fact that an alliance between the former President Saleh and the um, Ansarullah movement, um, by the way, a better name than Houthis, because Houthi makes it look like it's a clan family thing. It is a movement called Ansarullah that they fell out and Saleh was killed and he still commanded quite a substantial number of Yemenis that were in that, um, that alliance there. So to what extent Ansarallah will be able to mobilise more support is another question, but um, it's a, it's a, it is an open wound, it's a, it's a sore, it's a it's the terrible humanitarian disaster in the region and uh, the most important thing is to open the links, the international links, the transport, the aid links, get food into the country, get assistance in there. Um, that's got to be an important goal uh, for 2018. Mm -hmm. And then... Uh well, we hope we see some progress in that area. Uh, I don't know how much more um, punishment Yemen can take, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll see some good things happening, I hope, um, at least Saudi Arabia being censured. But that's also going to mean the United States and Britain will have to 
um, come clean with their role in in this war as well, or they'll just back away and scurry and hide uh, behind uh, another issue uh, when confronted about it. So, but in terms of Palestine. Um, after now the Syrian war uh, is being settled, ISIS is being routed uh, in Iraq, in Syria. Um, Syria is now receding from the headlines slightly, and this has opened up an opportunity for Palestine to emerge back uh, as, as a sort of a top issue now. Um, is, is this still an issue that, um, in terms of its symbolism, that could... Um, help to heal the region uh, is my first question. And secondly, I'm starting to hear more talk of a one-state solution, uh, one state for everybody. I'm hearing this from Hezbollah, uh, some spokespeople as well. I'm, I'm seeing this idea now, dumping this uh, two-state solution roadmap to peace that uh, came out of Oslo uh, and is clung to by so many Western um, experts and so forth. How, how are you looking at these two issues? Well, first of all, I don't really see uh, that. I disagree with a lot of people who think that symbolism over Palestine is a leading issue or, let's say, the dynamic edge of politics there. You know, there's been a lot of symbolism over Palestine for a very long time. Um, but to me, the, the essential issue is, you know, little people can't, fight big powers alone and divide it. It's impossible. You know, the, the great Latin American leaders point that out. That's why it was such an obsession with the late Hugo Chavez to create these regional organisations. And I see the Middle East in a similar sort of way, you know. The reunification talks between the factions in Palestine is important. There's a very low level of trust that the Palestinian people have with the major parties there at the moment. We know that because it's polled very well by the the Jerusalem Media uh, Centre, what's it called, JMCC. Um, very low level of support for the major parties there, but they believe in their processes. They want their processes to go ahead. There's also a war weariness, which I think the Israelis are counting on. So, in other words, whatever outside people talk about another infitata, intifada, it's, it's actually people are quite divided over that because they're the ones that have to pay the cost of any sort of conflict that's going on there. So it, that's relevant to any talk about compromise solutions. You talk about one state and two state and so on. Palestinian people, they're looking for some sort of relief from the constant repression, the constant uh, violence that we're seeing virtually every day, um, you know, transmitted from from the occupied territories there. But remember, the Palestinian people have to come together on these sorts of issues and they have to have strong regional allies. You know, people in other parts of the world and the foreign media are not are no way they're going to resolve this issue. Uh, to me, the only way that the Palestine issue can be resolved is if the Palestinians themselves are united and they have a very strong alliance in the region. And that means the traditional Arab alliance, including Iran, that was there to support them, that there's a strong axis of resistance. And you know this is the case because it's what the Israeli leaders fear. They fear the demise of Daesh in Syria. They fear the rise of a strong Syria with a, with a strong presence of Hezbollah and Iran there, because, precisely because they fear that that type of power, regional power, is what's going to start putting pressure on them to start doing things, that is to say, to get out of the occupied Jolan, for example. All international law is on the Syrian side there. It's a very large section of occupied territory that people don't talk about. Maybe there's not much symbolism about the occupied Jolan, but it's precisely a unified force, uh, what they call the axis of resistance. If they emerge stronger from these wars and confront Israel, they'll have some power to force some back down with Israel. They'll be able to start talking directly with Israel. Um, so that's... The, the longer-term future, I think, has a lot to do with the unity of Arab peoples in support. They all support Palestine in principle. What are they going to do about it? You pointed out before that the Saudis and Israel have become closer than ever because they are both uh, see in Iran as the big natural leader of those resistance, independent forces, let's say, in the region, is the greatest threat to them. They're correct in, in that sort of sense. That's what's driven the Saudis and Israel together. So to me, it's the, the unity of the people, the, the, the people in the resistance against the ethnic cleansing that's going on in Palestine and the, the cancer that is Israel. You can't have an apartheid state and have peace there, basically, as one of the UN 
uh, authors of the of the an important report earlier this year, which was suppressed at the UN. Um, what's his name? Richard uh, Richard Falk, I think, the great international lawyer, pointed out. This is an apartheid state which is a crime against humanity and the international community has a responsibility to resolve it. You can't say we're going to put a little Band-Aid over it. But maybe the Palestinian people will want some Band-Aids, you know, in the short term so that mm -hmm. the brutality against them, um, there's some pauses there. But uh, to me, looking at the longer term, um, really the unity of the Arab people in support of the Palestinians is, is critical. Yeah. Well, more than ever before, Tim, uh, there are just so many uh, hanging issues and so many things in, in flux uh, right now from 2017 going into 2018. And uh, we, we really appreciate here at the Sunday Wire uh, your views, your insights, and, uh, and a little bit of a look into your understanding of these issues. Uh, it's been a great, great conversation, uh, and uh, we wish you the best uh, coming ahead in 2018, Tim, with with all your work, and I know you've got a lot. Thanks, of, you've got a new book coming out, uh, hopefully next year as well. That uh, we're looking forward to uh, on Syria, I believe. Um, hopefully, on, on the whole region. Yeah, on the whole region. So that's going to be something to look forward to as well. So good luck uh, with all your projects this Thanks year, very Tim. Much, and uh, we really appreciate you. your hard work and your dedication to these issues.